Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. It's time for another bus stop and we're going to dig right into it. So recently on Twitter, I posted some benchmarks and why did I post benchmarks? Well, I did it because, you know, I got this new computer. It's a, it's a Ryzen 9 7950X. It's totally tricked out. It's, I mean, when I say tricked out, I mean, it is tricked out. It's got the full rainbow fans. It's everything. I mean, it's totally a gaming rig, but it turns out gaming rigs are really good for running like benchmarks. So I, pulled down Rider, I put all the latest mass transit code on it, and I started running the benchmark to see how with Net7 on the Ryzen 9, it would really, really go. And of course, it's it's like DDR5, it's, it's totally tricked out. But And the numbers I got were impressive. So normally I benchmark on a Mac Pro, which is a, it's a Xeon 16 core. Well, the Ryzen is also a 16 core, 32 threads. And so I wanted to see how much you know it, faster it was than the Mac Pro, and it was almost double. I mean, it was pretty close. I mean, RabbitMQ running in Docker through uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux 2, I was getting like 21,000 messages a second, and that's just JSON serialized full body messages. And compared to like 12,000 on my Mac Pro, so it was a pretty significant bump. And so I posted that because I'm super excited because who isn't excited when they get a new rig, especially now that desktops are the new hotness. You know, if you're if you're still coding on a laptop, you know, you know, ever since the first of the year, I think it was Damian Edwards who posted something about if you don't have a desktop, get a desktop. It's a whole new experience. So, you know, kind of fun there. But and I could totally agree. So, you know, I wanted to put that out there. I put that out there and immediately get a response, you know, within a few hours. It's like, that, you know, you think that's fast, but it isn't. Because, you know, 0MQ can do millions of messages a second. And it started, you know, you, anytime you get a response like that, you immediately think, oh, well, I want to defend my position. But I've looked at 0MQ, I've looked at NetNQ, and Drew Sellers, who's also on the call again today. Hello, hello. You know, we've all looked at this stuff and thought about, you know, when would you use a 0MQ, or there's a .NET native version of it for NetMQ. Mm -hmm. um, when would you use that versus, like, say, a RabbitMQ, and why is mass transit so centered around broker-based transports? Absolutely. I mean, mass transit centered around broker-based transports because that's where we started, right? Like, acknowledge the history. We For started sure. with MSMQ. Yes. <laughs> Was it a multi-node broker? No. Really just ran on the one on the one box. But that's fine. Uh, and then RabbitMQ came out, right? And so we, we moved to, to RabbitMQ. And I remember, I feel like right around that time is when ZeroMQ came out because... If I, I want to say 0MQ spun out of RabbitMQ, actually. Yeah, I don't know. My history could be fact-checked there pretty hard, but yeah, it could sure. be way wrong. But that's how I think of it, right? I remember, like, oh my gosh, it's zero. It's, it's even less. This thing's going to be amazing. Um, and I do want to say, man, the 0MQ technical docs for learning about patterns um and just really introducing you to new concepts if you've never played around are fantastic they have a very human voice to them they're not dry they talk about a lot of patterns and they really introduce a lot of good mental concepts but man oh man like it true to what it says on the 10 it's a socket library it's point a to point b and if you wanted to build something that an operator could work on after the fact without a lot of intense knowledge. I mean, I feel like you're setting yourself up for a big hill. No, for sure. Yeah. I, I think the timing is close, at least when we started getting turned on to it and the, the phrase right in the dock sockets on steroids. That's, that's really kind of the, the, the thing that goes to the heart of it. And yes, you know, comments went on further through the Twitter exchange of like, but you could build RabbitMQ with 0MQ. And that's exactly the kind of thinking that makes sense. It's like, yes, 0MQ is a set of primitives. And like Drew said, their docs are awesome. It's like, hey, let's add PubSub. Hey, let's add this. Oh, what about when we're disconnected? And it gives you this like incremental approach to basically build your own like message broker. And, you know, that sounds cool and everything. And I mean, it definitely gets the geeky wheels turning as far as like, oh, I want to build this. And then... Then the operations guy says, well, how do I monitor it? 
And then it's like, oh, yeah, so it's kind of a bespoke thing that we built that uses all these, you know, complex patterns and integration patterns and messaging patterns. But we haven't gotten around to building the cockpit yet. So you really just kind of got to look in this directory and see if there's files that are getting big <laughs> or <Yeah>. whatever. <laughs> so, yeah. So that bespoke experience, you know, as great as a developer, as a craftsman, it's like, wow, I built this thing and it's really cool. But then how do I support it? And that's the thing is by the time we're the ops guy asks us how we're going to support it. We're already thinking about the next cool thing we're going to build. We're done with that. That's 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 prior art. That's finished at this point. I'm on Nature to the next the thing. <laughs> so I'm off on another project now. I don't have time to support that. But when you use something like a broker, so whether it's MSMQ back in the day, whether it's RabbitMQ today, Azure Service Bus in the cloud, uh, SQS and SNS in AWS. I haven't played with Google PubSub, so I can't speak to that specifically. But all of those tools have a way for somebody that's not me, the coder, to see what's going on. And if you are following the patterns that libraries like Mass Transit and Service Bus and even ZeroMQ talk about, there's you're going to provide a way for an operator to get at things. And to see a message and to manipulate the message, to resubmit stuff, or ultimately to have visibility into the system to understand what's going on, why it's going on, and how do I fix things? Yeah, for sure. And and that kind of, you know, so there's definitely the operational aspect of it. Another thing I want to talk about is, yes, and this is performance. What's good enough performance? You know, because... Oh, yeah. You so, you're, so you're seeing on your, on your box, I did the math. And it was like point, it was like four nanos per message. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculously fast. It's a cool rig. But it's like, like, but we're talking, it was like you were seeing right around four nanoseconds per message. And I'm sure these messages were like nothing burgers. Yeah, they're just, a, but they're the full message envelope. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it, and that takes a while to serialize. Admittedly, most of the CPU time in that test is system text JSON doing the full message envelope with all those GUIDs. So there's a lot of mm -hmm. content in there. If I switched to raw JSON, it, I did, I actually did. I switched it to raw JSON and the numbers went up significantly, like well over 30,000. Okay. But yeah, so, okay, so we're talking four nanos per message, just, you know, we'll call it five. Uh, the the kind of running joke for us is how long's your database call? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and that's what it comes down to is if so what I can I can pump, you know, twenty, thirty thousand messages through a system or with zero MQ I could pump a million messages a second. But that four nanos, it takes longer than that to actually set up the connection to Postgres to actually read a row from the table that I want to return as part of this request. So really, if I can get 1,500 queries a second out of my Redis cache or my Postgres mm -hmm. database, I really only need to be able to handle a round trip time of about a millisecond. And that's 1,000 a second. So the numbers that we're talking about, is, and, and especially when you think about like, like what a message is doing. I mean, we're sending a message to a queue, another consumer is reading it from the queue, doing some work, probably writing a response to another queue that then gets picked up by the original submitter and then does something with that data. And, you know, in a zero MQ or even just, let's just think about HTTP. I mean, if, if zero MQ is a socket on steroids, just talk about the very basics of like HTTP, what is it? Hypertext transfer protocol. We're gonna mm -hmm. send some piece of data to a server, that server is going to do something with it, and then it's going to return or send a response back through that same socket connection to the client, which is going to get that back. And it's non-durable, which, you know, the biggest thing about using a message broker is durable queues, availability, partial availability, being able to accept orders without having the back-end order processing system available. So it's it's the benefits of that, but even just the HTTP operation, what do most people really get in terms of like, oh, we need to do these database calls through an HTTP API? What's your response mm -hmm. time? I mean, is it four nanoseconds or is it eight milliseconds or maybe on yeah. a bad day, 80 milliseconds or on a really bad day, a thousand milliseconds? Yeah. And on 20, like, if you have a 20 millisecond database query, which, like, let's say, that, you know, you got a 
you're probably not going to just execute one query on a given business average line of business application inside Joe company. You know, you might need three or four database calls. Let's say that, you know, you're dropping 20 millis on all of your database calls. So even with nothing else, with no view generation, with no serialization of those data structures, you know, you're doing, what is that? 50 a second? Yeah. Like 50 a second. So there's, there's a point where it, these numbers just don't matter. For sure. Um, but to me, but, they matter because I'm building a framework. I'm building something that runs on more than RabbitMQ. You know, I have in-memory operations. I have gRPC operations. You know, there's, mm -hmm. it's, it's optimizing so that, so that you can, so that I can honestly say when, when someone, I, and I get this yesterday, I got like a, a comment in one of the GitHub discussions. It says, hey, mass transit is slow. I'm only getting this amount of time. It's like, I can assure you and speak confidently every time I answer this question, the bottleneck is not mass transit. Mm -hmm. You know, it turns out it was, you know, a broker was running in a remote node that was an undersized broker that didn't have enough capacity for the message throughput they wanted. Once they changed the broker settings, boom, everything starts flying. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. But to me, as a framework author, I care about that because I don't want to be in the top of your profiler list when you're profiling your application looking for bottlenecks. Like in how, and so like, what's the takeaway, right? The, I'm trying to think here. We really want to look at, oh, okay. One of the takeaways that I wanted to talk about, or at least something else I wanted to talk about was the idea of like the protocol that you choose. Uh, and here I'm not talking like HTTP protocol, talking about the idea of a protocol in a more generic sense about how you're building out your application. Uh, I remember, Chris, you were talking, you were really worried about the protocol that you had implemented for job consumers. And job consumers have a very specific, they, like there's a dance that they have to do to make sure that your long running work completes. And can you talk, talk can you like unpack that job consumer protocol a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good example. I mean, it's a little more modern than Xmodem, not quite as cool as Kermit, but oh, wait, no. If you know mm -hmm. what those protocols are, welcome to the show. You're definitely old. But <laughs> but so, and, and that's the thing is the protocol is the conversation. When we talk about HTTP, there's a specified protocol. There's some headers, then there's the body, then there's headers, then there's the body. It's that, that dance that happens as part of that conversation. And, you know, a lot of times people are like, well, I have this one consumer and most of the time it's really fast, but occasionally it could be 30 minutes long. Okay, well, why would or wouldn't you want to make that a job consumer? So a normal consumer runs, the message is read from the queue, it's locked, it's processed, and then it's dropped, it's acknowledged from the queue and it's done. Could happen in four nanoseconds. But for a job consumer, the message is read from a queue and then, you know, there's a handshake that happens. A message gets sent to a saga for the job. The job saga then tries to lock a slot so that you can manage the concurrency of all the instances. It then acknowledges back and says, hey, your slot is locked. Great, I'm going to initiate an attempt. Great, we're going to run it on this note. So there's a good six or seven messages exchanging hands before it even gets to the actual job consumer to start processing the job. And all of those exchanges take time because they're all saga based. So it's going to depend upon the throughput of your saga repository. So there's a lot of moving parts to make that happen. And that, that protocol composes that entire conversation of executing a job consumer. So then there's the post back saying, oh yeah, the consumer completed. Let's do this. Let's publish the job completed, done and dusted. So it's a lot more involved and the latency of each of those steps is significantly more important than the fact that a message takes four nanoseconds to written and consumed from a broker. Mm -hmm. Right on, man. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know to wrap up. <laughs> well, I, I'd say, you know, like from a wrap up perspective, the thing that I want to take away is when you're choosing your tools, like ultimately be aware of who's going to have to support them in the end. Uh, I've definitely made that mistake many times, not thinking about who was going to take care of it after I left mm -hmm. and, or I would make an optimal decision for me as the developer 
which turned into a suboptimal decision for the operations staff that was going to, you know, take care of this thing for the next 10 years. Right. Uh, and I've learned to, you know, that the, both people are stakeholders and that I need, I may need to give so, so that they can take. Yeah, for sure. I think the, the takeaway for me is, and this kind of wraps up the whole concept of why am I not just using a point to point socket versus using a broker and building applications that is this stuff used to be hard when we had to hard code all the point to point integrations and we had to define socket protocols between two applications. We were always like locked into the same language, the same tool set, the same SDK. And while mass transit provides a lot of useful paradigms out of the box, it makes it great to build dot net to dot net. Jason is Jason and a message is a message and you can build highly interoperable systems by putting a message broker in the middle that handles the message transfer. It's a standard protocol. There's client libraries for all the languages. And now integration is just something that we kind of do because it's gotten to the point of, you know, mere simplicity once you understand how messaging works. Now, HTTP is similar and you can do RPC based stuff like that. And it has a lot of great use cases, but when you want that durable messaging and you want to build the, you know, kind of reliable integrations between your systems, you know, it's, it's just gotten so much easier by saying, oh, well, we're talking to RabbitMQ and here's our message format. Great. Now we can continue that conversation. So that's the big thing for me of why that matters. So. Right on. Well, thanks, Chris. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. We'll catch you in the next bus stop.